Designed in 1974 and still going strong, the EMU is the spacesuit that astronauts continue to use on the International Space Station. Gemini was the brief but intense interim program where NASA pioneered rendezvous maneuvers needed for lunar missions. In 1963, Project Mercury had come as far as the technology would allow. The final three missions were cancelled so that NASA could shift focus to a new program and develop the techniques needed to reach the moon. It was decided that before embarking on the three-man Apollo program, as had been intended, an intermediate stage to learn about orbital rendezvous and docking was needed. It was in Houston that Mr. Kennedy emphasized the need for peaceful uses. It was called Project Gemini, and in many ways, the new program's capsule was more advanced than the Apollo spacecraft that would follow it. It was designed for a two-man crew, and astronauts referred to it as the Gusmobile because Mercury veteran Gus Grissom had played a major role in its development. The Gemini spacecraft would have the ability to change its orbit, and it included instrumentation and systems that were borrowed from jet fighters. One of its most revolutionary features was its onboard computer. It had a memory of just 20 kilobytes. At the beginning, it was proposed that the Gemini capsule wouldn't have landing parachutes, but a regalo wing. Grissom was involved in the early tests before this idea was abandoned. It added a layer of complexity that couldn't be easily accommodated in the capsule's design, and NASA reverted to the traditional water landing. To boost the Gemini spacecraft to orbit, NASA hastily adapted the US Air Force's Titan II missile. The Titan II had a much simpler design because it used hypergolic propellant which could remain stored in the rocket for long periods. The two fuel components didn't have to be kept at sub-zero temperatures, but they were extremely toxic and dangerous to handle. Designers understood that any launch mishap wouldn't cause the large explosion seen with liquid oxygen, so they dispensed with the launch escape system used in the Mercury program and equipped the Gemini capsule with ejector seats. Of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, only Grissom, Shirar and Cooper remained with the rest, having left NASA or having been suspended for medical reasons. To bolster its core of space pilots, NASA took in a second group of nine astronauts in 1962 and another 14 the following year. Before the astronauts could fly, the Gemini-Titan combination had to be tested to demonstrate its reliability. The booster was prone to rapid variations in thrust, known as pogo oscillations. Modifications were made to the rocket and unmanned flights of Gemini 1 and 2 were made in 1964 and 1965. Mercury veteran Gus Grissom and new recruit John Young would fly the first manned Gemini mission. Because the Gemini craft was fitted with ejector seats, they had special training exercises that involved parachuting into the water. The two astronauts also spent long hours in the Gemini simulator, where engineers could run them through challenging scenarios that may happen in space, while also training mission controllers. The Gemini 3 flight was scheduled for March the 23rd, 1965, and as the launch date approached, publicity became intense. The new President Lyndon Johnson was keen to be seen with the next astronauts. America was gaining confidence about its future in space. Five days before Gemini 3 was due to blast off, 
the Soviet Union launched a two-man spacecraft. What nobody was expecting was another record, the world's first spacewalk. Cosmonaut Alexei Leonov left his Voskhod 2 capsule to float freely in space for 12 minutes. In the West, it was perceived as another Soviet triumph. In reality, Leonov's suit had distorted and he was only just able to get back inside. The whole mission was plagued with difficulties, but these details didn't come to light for decades. For America, Gemini 3 felt like a welcome return to space. It had been almost two years since a NASA astronaut had been in orbit. It would be the first of ten manned Gemini missions. American media was making the astronauts household names. Achievements of the new maneuverable craft in space included the first change in orbital shape and the first change in orbital plane. After just three orbits, Grissom and Young returned to Earth. During the Mercury program, astronauts had named their capsules. Grissom had named Gemini 3 Molly Brown, after the Broadway show The Unsinkable Molly Brown. NASA did not like this, as it was a reference to Grissom's Mercury capsule that had sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Barely three days after their return to Earth, Grissom and Young were at the White House where President Johnson presented them with NASA's Distinguished Service Medal. Then, something that was to become common across the Gemini missions, a ticker tape parade through the streets of New York. NASA understood that the American public needed something in return for the hugely expensive space program. It gave them a new brand of hero. The next mission, Gemini 4, would be a much longer duration flight. Its crew would be from NASA's second intake of astronauts, Ed White and Jim McDivitt. They had been in training for three years. White had been practicing with a special maneuvering unit that he would use during NASA's first spacewalk. Gemini 4 blasted off on the 3rd of June, 1965. After the previous flight had verified the spacecraft, this mission would work out how to use it. Soon after reaching orbit, the crew located the rocket's discarded second stage and tried to move towards it using visual cues only. But the more McDivitt maneuvered towards it, the further away the booster got. Rendezvous was going to be harder than it seemed, and Mission Control called the exercise off. Okay, there was a more the important down. task. Okay, the During the third orbit, Ed White opened the door of the depressurized capsule, and using the maneuvering unit nicknamed the Zip Gun, he moved into the void. This exercise had been shifted up the Gemini schedule after the success of Alexei Leonov's spacewalk. Soon a stray glove drifted from the capsule. It would continue in orbit for another month before burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. The spacewalk was successful except for a small break in communications. The flight director says get back in. Got any message for us? Jimmy Porter, get back in. Okay. I don't know, we're coming over to the west, the west end. They want you to come back in now. Roger, we've been trying to talk to you for a while here. Another first for Gemini 4 was that the control center had moved from Cape Canaveral to a new home in Houston. And because the mission was due to last four days, it was the first time that three separate eight-hour shifts had gone into operation. There had been a problem with the computer and the hatch had been difficult to open and close, but 
as Gemini 4 re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, Mission Control regarded the flight as a success. But they now knew future missions would have to focus on orbital rendezvous. Post-flight honours for White and McDivitt included a ceremony at the University of Michigan, where they had both studied. At another ceremony, the President pinned NASA's Exceptional Service Medals on them. The Gemini program was just starting to deliver, but America was still not sure if they were catching up with the Soviet Union. But the future for Gemini seemed bright. Venus is just over 43 million kilometres away. Early astronomers believed it to be similar to Earth. In 2005, ESA launched the Venus Express mission. And after eight years of close observation, we now know a lot more about our planet's nearest neighbour. Surface temperatures on Venus are more than 450 degrees Celsius, and its atmospheric pressure is almost 100 times greater than here on Earth. You have clouds that are made up of um, sulfuric acid, in fact, so it's a very nasty place to be at. And the, that's one of the big questions on, on, on Venus. Why did Venus go that way and why did we on the Earth go this way? The planet takes 243 Earth days to rotate on its own axis and only 220 days to go around the Sun. and its rotation is opposite to Earth's, with the sun rising in Venus's west. In Venus's upper atmosphere, violent winds blow at speeds up to 400 kilometers per hour, and it has permanent hurricanes almost 200 kilometers across, moving around its poles. Information about the climate and magnetic field has been gathered by Venus Express since it went into orbit around Venus in 2006. It has been made available to a broad cross-section of experts. As Venus Express neared the end of its operational life, its handlers began taking risks, guiding the probe closer and closer to the planet, where it could observe in greater detail. In a manoeuvre known as aerobraking, the probe edged through Venus's upper atmosphere. We are going so close that we actually sense the atmosphere as a friction against uh, the structure of the, of the spacecraft. And in that way we can measure uh, densities in the, in, the, in, the, in the atmosphere of Venus that we have not been able to measure for all those eight years we've been circling the planet. So we also measure magnetic fields with a magnetometer and we measure energetic particles that we find there. So it's a very new type of measurements and very valuable data we're collecting these days. In the end, Venus Express exceeded its design brief to collect a new class of information about Venus. This helps us to understand the evolution of our solar system and, with Venus being very close to the size of Earth, science is gaining an insight into Earth's possible future. Since the earliest days of flights to space, each new spacecraft had a new spacesuit designed specially to go with it. The Mercury program used a version of the US Navy's Mark IV. The Gemini astronauts wore the G3C and G5C, which were based on the suit worn by X-15 pilots. They had to cope with possible ejection and with spacewalks. The Apollo astronauts wore versions of the A7L spacesuit. It had to be able to cope with the lunar environment and protect its wearer during what often looked like hard labour. With the development of the Space Shuttle came two new spacesuits. The ACES or pumpkin suits worn by crew during launch and landing. And for work outside in the vacuum of space, the EMU, 
for extravehicular mobility unit. The EMU is like a mini spacecraft. It provides self-contained life support for its wearer for more than eight hours and it was the suit in which astronauts learned in-space construction techniques during the early shuttle years. The design was commissioned by NASA in 1974, and although there have been many refinements, essentially the same EMU is still in service on the International Space Station. It was the EMU that enabled the construction of the orbiting laboratory. The suit has 14 different layers with a range of different functions including insulation from extremes of temperature and protection from micrometeoroids. Pressure inside the suit is about one quarter of standard atmospheric pressure. Higher suit pressures mean less mobility, but the low pressure means the astronaut must breathe pure oxygen. Nitrogen bubbles would condense in the wearer's bloodstream and body tissue if low-pressure air was used. In preparation for a spacewalk, an astronaut must pre-breathe pure oxygen for several hours to purge his system of nitrogen, and this process starts before the astronaut begins getting into his suit. The upper part of the suit is a rigid shell made from fiberglass. It provides firm attachment for the life support backpack and a tool kit mounted at the chest. As part of their preparation for a sojourn on the International Space Station, mission specialists will spend long hours training in the EMU at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab in Houston. Crew members have to be prepared for unexpected maintenance tasks outside the ISS. Problems with solar panels, coolant loops and leaky plumbing have required repair spacewalks. The Russian Orland suit is also used on the ISS. It affords slightly less mobility than the EMU, but it is much quicker to put on and its on-orbit maintenance is much simpler. The EMU was designed to be serviced on the ground, but ISS crews have had to adapt and learn how to open up the suit to locate problems and fix them. For complex repairs, ground specialists have even prepared video instructions for the ISS crew to follow. Leak problem. Every time the suit is put on, it is checked for leaks. While small losses are expected, any significant leak must be repaired immediately. Shuttle astronaut and physician Michael Barrett had to locate and replace a damaged O-ring. The failure of such a small part could threaten a whole mission. A new Z-series spacesuit is being developed, but evaluations will not be complete until at least 2020. So the familiar EMU will remain in service for a while yet. the 1970s vintage suit that built the ISS and kept the Hubble Space Telescope working deserves its big reputation. Three, two, unité, podium. When a probe or satellite is launched, it can only perform its function because of a complex communications infrastructure here on Earth. A craft operating in deep space sends data via a transmitter with signal strength similar to a domestic light bulb. By the time it reaches Earth, a distance measured in millions of kilometres, this signal is incredibly weak. ESA, the European Space Agency, has three giant dishes at locations around the world so it can communicate with its array of deep space probes. Sobreros is situated in a rural area west of the Spanish capital Madrid, 
where electromagnetic interference is at a minimum. The 35 metre dish is capable of fine pointing accuracy. Not only does the dish have to point directly at its distant target probe, it must track with it to compensate for both the probe's movement and the Earth's rotation. The 620 ton dish must move smoothly and with an accuracy of within one kilometre at a distance of a hundred million kilometres. ESA's deep space dishes have to transmit as well as receive. For this, the power of the transmitter is important. A signal strength of 20,000 watts is focused into a narrow beam by the parabolic dish. The first antenna in ESA's deep space network was built at New Norcia in southwestern Australia. It's similar in design to Sabreros, the station which picks up signals from probes as the Earth's rotation takes them out of New Norcia's line of sight. Currently, the deep space network has a heavy workload as the Rosetta probe continues to transmit its own data and relay information from the Philae lander. The final member of ESA's deep space trio is Malague in Argentina, 1200 kilometers west of Buenos Aires. This is the system's newest antenna, having been finished less than two years ago. It completes the network's coverage of the sky in any direction at any time. The three deep space dishes are coordinated from ESOC, the European Space Operations Centre in Darmstadt, Germany. In addition to the deep space probes, ESOC is also responsible for communication with Earth orbiting satellites via a different group of smaller ground stations monitoring spacecraft in polar orbits. For more than 45 years, the centre has provided the link between Earth and a variety of research spacecraft. Currently, the network is controlling 13 different long-term missions. OK, I'm out. OK, now, out. Close OK, I put a little roll in, took it right out. Gemini was NASA's hastily conceived bridging program, designed to perfect I techniques need needed on. for a lunar landing. Gemini 4 saw astronaut Ed White leave his capsule and walk in space, but the spacecraft's attempt to rendezvous with its booster had been a failure. Gemini 5 had set an American endurance record of close to eight days, but its rendezvous exercise had failed as well. On the morning of October the 25th, 1965, two rockets stood awaiting launch at Cape Canaveral. While astronauts Wally Shirar and Tom Stafford prepared for blast-off on Gemini 6, a special Atlas Agena target vehicle stood waiting on Pad 14. Because rendezvous and docking was integral to its moon landing strategy, NASA had commissioned the Agena docking module it would be carried to orbit atop an Atlas booster. As the Gemini 6 crew were being strapped in, the Atlas Agena combination was entering the final minutes of its countdown. The plan was for Gemini 6 to rendezvous and dock with the Agena four times in a flight that was expected to last two days. Gemini 6 was scheduled to launch around 90 minutes after the Agena, with the countdowns being tightly synchronised. The target vehicle lifted off as planned. This was the first Agena flight as part of the Gemini program, but the Atlas booster had served well during the Mercury program, and the Air Force had had success with the Agena upper stage, so no problems were expected. Gemini 6 waited as the target vehicle accelerated after a perfect launch. But minutes later, as the upper stage separated, all telemetry was lost and tracking radar detected five separate pieces. The Gemini mission was now pointless and the launch was cancelled with Shirar and Stafford leaving their spacecraft.
There was debate about what to do next. Scheduling for the Gemini program had been tight, with roughly one new launch every six weeks. There was no replacement Agena ready to launch before the next flight, Gemini 7. On the morning of December the 4th, 1965, astronauts Jim Lovell and Frank Borman were breakfasting before the launch of their Gemini 7 spacecraft. Among the others dining with them were the Gemini 6 crew, who would launch nine days later. Gemini 7 was to be the longest duration flight yet, and for comfort during almost 14 days in orbit, the crew were wearing new lightweight spacesuits. NASA's doctors were worried about the effect prolonged exposure to weightlessness would have on astronauts, particularly the observed loss of red blood cells. Gemini 7 was designed to answer medical questions. It launched on schedule before Gemini 6, which had been renamed Gemini 6A. It had taken NASA more than 60 days to prepare for a new launch. Now crews had eight days till the launch of Gemini 6A and they swung into action immediately. As soon as they reached orbit, the Gemini 7 crew turned their craft and began tracking with its upper stage. Gemini 4 attempted this but it failed due to an insufficient knowledge of orbital mechanics. On December the 12th, Shira and Stafford again prepared for launch. If all went well, within six hours of blast off, they would be orbiting alongside Gemini 7. The launch pad crew had done an excellent job readying the booster in record time and the countdown continued smoothly. Two, one. But then shut down. The engines had started and after one second they stopped. The commander Shira had the option of pulling the D-ring and ejecting both of them from the capsule, but he sat tight. Nobody knew what had gone wrong. For a second time, the crew of Gemini 6 had failed to launch. A connector had come away before the booster had lifted off, and the onboard computer closed everything down. This was rectified, along with another glitch in a turbo pump. Three days later, they were ready to try again. Go. Five, four, three, two, one. The flight plan called for the rendezvous to happen on Gemini 6's fourth orbit, and Shira made the first orbital correction 94 minutes into the flight. Gemini 7 would remain passive, with all orbital adjustments being made by Gemini 6. After three hours, slightly more than 400 kilometres separated the two craft and Gemini 7 was picked up by Shira and Stafford on radar. After five hours, Gemini 7 appeared as a bright dot, and soon after, the two spacecraft were flying in formation. Six and seven away, we'll be standing by if you have anything for us. Okay. Three years earlier, in 1962, the Russians had launched Vostok 3 and 4 so that they could pass close to each other and it had seemed like another Soviet triumph. With the rendezvous of Gemini 6 and 7, the Americans realised that the Vostoks had accomplished two well-timed launches, a very different achievement to the precision on-orbit changes they had accomplished. For more than four hours, the two spacecraft flew side by side, sometimes coming as close as 30 centimetres. 
It gave NASA confidence in its rendezvous technique, but there had not been a docking as had originally been intended when the target had been the Agena. After slightly more than a day in orbit, Gemini 6 re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and was picked up in the Atlantic Ocean. Gemini 7 continued on in orbit for two more record-breaking days, with Borman and Lovell reading books to pass the time. They returned to Earth on December the 18th and were picked up by the WASP, the same ship that had recovered the Gemini 6 crew. It was at this point that NASA started to believe the American space program was gaining greater expertise than their Soviet adversaries. However, the elusive docking exercise had still not taken place and nobody realised just how difficult this would be. When the Cassini probe reached Saturn, staff at the JPL Operations Center watched eagerly for confirmation that it had carried out its orbital insertion instructions. It arrived in July 2004 after a journey lasting almost seven years and it had to perform a precisely aligned 95 minute burn to enter a highly eccentric orbit. Because of the great distances involved, the craft has to perform autonomously. Instructions to Cassini are sent a long time in advance via the Deep Space Network. Signals confirming that it had gone into orbit took 85 minutes to reach Earth. After six months orbiting Saturn, Cassini approached Titan, Saturn's biggest moon. By this stage, it had already flown past Titan several times, capturing radar and photographic images. This time, it released a lander, the Huygens probe. Titan is so large, it holds a thick atmosphere, so Huygens was equipped with a heat shield and a parachute. As it was floating down towards the surface, the lander began taking photographs and analysing the atmosphere's constituent gases. It made the first soft landing in the outer solar system, and although it performed well, relaying data back to Cassini, only one of the orbiter's recorders was on. Half of the images were lost. We now know that Titan has lakes on its surface, lakes of liquid methane. The Cassini probe has been active for more than 10 years and during that time it's helped us learn about the strange behaviour of Saturn. At first it seemed that the northern and southern hemispheres of the gas giant were rotating at different rates but it now appears that the wind speeds in the south are faster. Cassini's looping orbit is regularly modified so that it can pass close by features that mission specialists want to study. Another Saturnian moon, Enceladus, surprised observers. It is one-tenth the size of Titan, yet it appears to hold a thin atmosphere of water vapour. Observations suggest this atmosphere is being replenished by cold water volcanoes near the South Pole. Cassini is equipped with a mass spectrometer and it was able to detect salt, water and various hydrocarbons. It is now thought that a salty ocean lies beneath Enceladus' icy crust. Some planetary physicists believe Saturn's inner E-ring receives its particles from Enceladus. In 2008 Cassini was renamed the Equinox mission and recently it received another extension and became the Cassini Solstice mission. It takes Saturn roughly 30 Earth years to orbit the Sun and, like the Earth, its axis is tilted so it has seasons. When Cassini arrived, the planet's north pole was in shadow 
and it was only recently that the probe could capture images of the peculiar hexagonal polar vortex. This hexagonal pattern was first observed in the 1980s by the Voyager mission. As spring in Saturn's northern hemisphere progressed, two giant storms were seen developing. They showed us hot spots in the infrared part of the spectrum, with both travelling towards the west. The larger storm moved faster, eventually engulfing the smaller one. Even after disturbances and the cloud patterns had dissipated, the storm still registered in the infrared. The rings orbit over Saturn's equator, extending from 6,000 to 120,000 kilometres above the surface, yet they are only 20 metres thick. They're made of ice, with particle sizes ranging from fine dust to 10 metre chunks. There are clumps within the rings that have changed since the Voyager's visits in the early 80s, with the inner F-ring seeming to vary over a period of weeks. Saturn has at least 150 moons, and moonlets within the rings are thought to disturb the particles. Toward the end of its mission, with fuel running low, the risky trajectory will begin. Cassini will pass between the planet and its innermost ring, where the chance of collision with orbiting debris is extreme. It will sample the upper atmosphere and learn about the mass of the rings. To avoid possible contamination of the fragile moons, Cassini will ultimately be crashed into Saturn. In 2005, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was headed to what were becoming the crowded skies above the Red Planet. Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Express and Mars Odyssey were in orbit around Mars, and the Spirit and Opportunity rovers were on the surface. But the MRO has a lot of different tasks, all paving the way for future Mars missions and culminating in a manned landing on the Red Planet in about 15 years. It has been mapping Mars in fine detail, and this information has already been used to select a landing site for the Phoenix lander. The orbiter is also collecting detailed information about the weather patterns on Mars. While it continued to transmit a clearer picture of the planet, back on Earth, a new rover was taking shape. A rover like none before, and one that would work very closely with the MRO. Lockheed Martin, under the supervision of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, was building a rover the size of a small car. Unlike previous rovers, it wouldn't use solar panels for its power. It's equipped with a radioisotope thermoelectric generator with a minimum lifespan of 14 years. Known as Curiosity, the rover has a range of cameras and chemical analysis tools, as well as a robotic arm and radiation detector. Before it could fly, Curiosity had to be tested at extreme temperatures and vibration. Towards the end of 2011, Curiosity, fixed into its entry, descent and landing module, was packed into the nose cone of an Atlas V. Because of the proximity of Mars, Six, the launch five, window was extremely four, narrow. Three, two, one, main engine start, zero, and lift off. It would take the craft more than eight months to reach Mars. The Centaur upper stage pushed the craft out of Earth orbit onto a trans-Mars trajectory. Before they separated, the Curiosity package was set rotating for stability. The crew's assembly was equipped with heaters to maintain stable temperatures for critical subsystems that remained dormant during the cruise phase. 
Solar cells provide power for communication with mission control and thrusters are used for course corrections. Things are looking good. I'm gonna monitor. As it approached Mars, the team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory waited. Ten minutes before reaching Mars's atmosphere, the crew stage was jettisoned and an incredibly complex sequence of events was about to unfold. As it entered the atmosphere, it was traveling at about 20,000 kilometers per hour, and the first stage of deceleration began. The thrusters kept the craft aligned to the target, selected with the help of the MRO. Signals confirming each stage of the descent were relayed back to JPL via the Mars Odyssey. Next, balance weights were thrown off, so the craft could keep the correct attitude for parachute deployment. Still moving at 1600 kilometers per hour, the small parachute unfurled and the heat shield was discarded. From orbit, the MRO captured this image of the descent stage. At 1500 meters, the descent stage separated from the back shell and the landing thrusters ignited. The radar altimeter monitored both the craft's height and its speed. At a height of 20 meters and now moving at 3 kilometers per hour, the rover was lowered on cables and the wheels deployed. When it was on firm ground, it fired pyros, severing the cables. The sky crane technique was used so that dust and debris stirred up by the rockets couldn't damage the rover. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Most of these JPL people have devoted large parts of their lives to this project. This was the first time such a landing had been attempted, and it had been flawless. Almost immediately, an image was relayed back. Using one of its hazard avoidance cameras, Curiosity had sent an image of the surface and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was playing a vital role as a communications hub. It records signals sent by the rover's UHF transmitter and retransmits them when it can see Earth. Curiosity had been set down near the Gale Crater, just south of the Martian equator. Initially, the rover began transmitting detailed information about its system status and its descent and landing experience. During its first days on Mars, the rover's now redundant flight program was dumped and replaced with surface operations software. Its camera mast was extended and Curiosity began changing completely the way we think about Mars.